Okay, so we just briefly, um, I think we're not going to take much of your time, um, really, for this. Because I think we, we would like to have more, more time to, to, to establish a, a bit of a dialogue and a bit of a discussion about what is happening in the city. Um, so briefly, just two or three trends which I think are important, and then some examples of what is happening in some cities, then some uh, uh, examples of cultural planning, the way I understand cultural planning in the context of regeneration, um, and then simply drawing some conclusions. Um, first of all, uh, trends. Trends. I mean, I'm, I'm by formation, I'm an urban sociologist, so you would expect me to kind of go back to the big society and look at trends. I'm sure you are all aware. Um, as cities are becoming uh, more and more important in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of globalized world today. More and more people want to live in cities. And at the moment, we have half of the world population living in cities. By 2030, it could be three quarters of the world uh, population living in cities. So we got a big trend of people moving towards cities. Now, it doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that we have people moving from the countryside to cities. It means essentially people moving between cities, which means that some cities are shrinking and becoming less important, and others are growing and becoming more and more important. So here is one trend to bear in mind for civic leaders, etc., that not every city is expanding. Some cities are declining. And it would be interesting to know why is it that some cities decline and why some cities uh, develop further. Cities also are becoming much and more, much more diversified, much more diverse. So we have more and more of a variety of cultures, lifestyles, um, um, if you want patterns of living that characterize these contemporary cities. So it's no use for policymakers and especially for people working in culture to base their cultural programming on, uh, on cities that were maybe um, valid in the 19th century. Cities of the 21st century are <coughs> diverse cities and they are inhabited by a variety of cultures. Okay, so, so this is what we are having in cities, not what we had, the, the kind of monocultural cities of the past, but the multicultural, the intercultural cities of today. So this is another trend which is very important to take into consideration if you are doing cultural programming and if you are doing also economic development to a certain extent and tourism plans too. So we take it for granted that Big industries have gone, so we are living in a post-industrial cities, and we tend to take it for granted that everybody's going to work uh, with IT, and, uh, and everybody's going to make a living out of uh, the exchange of knowledge and the information. Um, it is, you, if, if you look at the recent management books uh, published over the past 10, 15 years, Everybody talks about the weightless economy, which means nobody's producing anything that is traded as heavy goods, as it used to be in the past. Everybody's trading uh, knowledge, apparently, right now. So I'm slightly skeptical on this because I feel this is a bit of a blanket <laughs> definition uh, within which we have no space or no room to uh, rethink a role of certain cities who have lost their industry. But this is a trend in any case, and it's worth bearing in mind. Um, another trend that have, we have seen in the past 20 years is that cities more and more uh, base their um, attractiveness, if you want, their economy, um, on, on the idea that culture is, is, is a catalyst, culture is a key. Now, some cities understand culture as the art, some cities understand culture as the creative industries. Some cities understand culture as leisure and commerce only. So they all have a different understanding of this. And it was the American academic Sharon Zukin who said, culture is now the business of cities. But by that, she means culture is really es essentially what you see driving the regeneration of, of post-industrial cities. Okay, you can be skeptical about it, 
but but this is a tendency. If you think of, um, for example, of the Ruhr Valley in Germany, if you see what happened to, to the Ruhr over the past 20 years or something, it's a complete transformation uh, from heavy industry, from coal to a certain extent, to culture and leisure. And that's, and that's another trend. Now, in more detail, in more detail, what is happening is also we have seen a lot of uh, regeneration or transformation of uh, river sites, harbour sites, city centres, um, of, of central downtown areas of cities across Europe, across the Western world, I would say. And it's now beginning to happen also in the developing countries. Um, one thing that is in common is that places that have lost industries, they are back in culture, culture is leading on transforming places. Why is that? Because there is a certain understanding that culture can uh, mobilize uh, new identity values. Culture can, uh, in a sense, transform um, all memories, old memories of place into some kind of uh, contemporary happening um, place, etc. What are examples? Here, you know, we can go from Birmingham to Helsinki to Amsterdam, just to give you a few examples. These are all examples of uh, former industrial spaces, cable factory, custard factory. Do you know what custard is? It's this kind of cream that you put on cakes. It's a yellowish stuff, um, which was very, very much in use in Victorian era uh, and still now uh, in, in, in Britain. Um, so this was a former custard factory transformed into, uh, I think it's 10,000 square feet of creative industries spaces. This is, uh, this started, this particular transformation started in the early 80s in, in Birmingham and is still, to a certain extent, driving, driving the change in image that, that Birmingham has had over the past 20 years. Um, now, we will have a short, a short comment also on this particular uh, development. Um, the cable factory, similar things. Uh, it's a historic transformation in a sense. It's one of the first examples of case studies of culture-led regeneration. Um, but I, the picture you can see here is probably during one of the festivals. Normally, if you go there, it's much quieter. Uh, but then again, it's a, it's, it's a massive uh, uh, space for creative industries. They probably have something like 300 studios of artists or something, big exhibition spaces, uh, spaces for music, etc., etc. Amsterdam, the Westergaster Brief, which some of you will know, is, is a culture park. It's a culture park. So it's a massive space. They got a river in it. They got, they got kind of green spaces in it, they got bars, cafes, and they have 10,000 square feet of creative industries, spaces in there. Now, all this is gigantism. It really is, to me, it's like, th these are gigantic developments in, in cities. But on the other hand, if you think of the old industries, they were, they were equally gigantic. Now, what, what these spaces offer, they offer employment within the creative industries and within the kind of cultural field broadly defined. It's not just the art. It's a cultural field broadly defined. It includes the art, but it includes also design, architecture, fashion, music, etc. So we are talking about developments that are driven by the creative industries. You all know about this. Now, my, uh, over the past 10 years, I have been visiting, writing, uh, helping civic leaders, mayors, etc to develop these kind of spaces. But I have to say, my attitude towards this kind of approach is always a little bit skeptical. And, and my point of view is really, a key question to me is, can culture alone change places? And, and why do I ask this? Because what I, what I see is, as a result, of the transformation of some spaces, as you see in the cast 